الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله we're going to start our program with some recitation of the Quran so if I can invite أستاد أبو هريرة to come and recite some verses from the Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن في اختلاف الليل والنهار وما خلق الله في السماوات والأرض وما خلق الله في السماوات والأرض لا آيات لقوم يتقون إن الذين لا يرجون لقاءنا ورضوا بالحياة الدنيا ورضوا بالحياة الدنيا وطمأنوا بها والذين هم عن آياتنا غافلون أولئك مأواهم النار بما كانوا يكسبون إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات يهديهم ربهم بإيمانهم تجري من تحتهم الأنهار في جنات النعيم دعواهم فيها سبحانك اللهم وتحيتهم فيها سلام وآخر دعواهم أن الحمد لله رب العالمين In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, surely in the alternation of the night and the day, and in all that Allah has created in the heavens and the earth, there are signs for the people who seek to avoid error of outlook and conduct. Surely those who do not expect to meet us, who are gratified with the life of the world and are well pleased with it and are heedless of our signs, their home shall be the fire in return for their misdeeds. Surely those who believe in the truth revealed in the book and do righteous deeds, their Lord will guide them aright because of their faith. Rivers shall flow beneath them in the gardens of bliss. Their cry in it will be, Glory be to you, our Lord, and their greeting, peace. And their cry will always end with, all praise be to Allah, the Lord of the entire universe. And Allah has spoken the truth. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Sayyid al-Awwaleen wa al-Akhileen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahi sadri wa yisir li amri wa hlul uqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his community, his family, and those who follow them until the end of time. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. It's great to be here, alhamdulillah, in your center. It's a beautiful center, very impressive. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Bless this effort of yours and we ask him to make it sincerely for his, his sake and a means of your mawfirah 
with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Quran, he recognizes the importance of parents in a number of places and the role of parents. And perhaps no more is it done more eloquently than in the 12th chapter of the Quran, Surah Yusuf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, quoting Prophet Yusuf, إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبًا وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ وَرَأَيْتُمْ لِسَاجِدِينَ He said, you know, very beautifully that Sayyidina Yusuf is talking to his father. And it's interesting that the context of the conversation is between a father and a son, because that's our topic, the role of fathers in the lives of their children. What are the like, qualities we should look for as fathers? And for some of you, maybe you're saying, well, I'm not a father yet. Well, you know, think ahead of the game, bro. Don't wait to become a father to learn how to be a father. And in this verse, he says, I saw uh, in my dream 11 stars and the sun and the moon prostrating. And Imam Al-Tabari, he said that the sun and the moon uh, are his parents, that the sun is his father and that the, the moon is his mother. So the family shines the light of the father. The father is this illuminating body who in his obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is in his relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his light shines and casts itself upon the family in the darkness of this dunya. So the brighter the father's light, the brighter the family's light will be insha'Allah ta'ala. It's very powerful. So, so important is it to be active fathers and to be engaged in the lives of our children that we see the barakah for taking the time as we've seen in building this institution. Obviously, I'm sure one of the motivating factors was your children and the future of your community. Such that in the Quran we find, actually it's remarkable, that in Surah Al-Tur, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقَنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those who believe and they died, and they left believing offspring, they will be united together in heaven. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he said as is related by Ibn Kathir in his tafsir from Al-Tabari, which is of course the summary of Al-Tabari, he said that there will be some uh, offspring of people who weren't really the best of Muslims. They were, you know, okay. But their parents were very good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unite them. They will bring them together because of the iman that they shared in Jannah. And it will be said to them, you have been united because of this iman that you left amongst yourselves. So that's in the hereafter. But even after our death, and we ask Allah to give us husn al-khatima, if we take the time to look after our children, and if we ensure that we lived noble lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him even after our death. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحَا Surah so Al-Kaf, you know, that those orphans, their father was righteous. Because of his righteousness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. Imam Ahmed Zaruq, is a great scholar, he said, as a father, I realize that when I am good with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I see that goodness on my children. And when I disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I see the athra of ma'asi, I see the impact of disobeying him in the lives of my children as a father. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ihfadhi laha yahfadhk, Ihfadhi laha tajiru tajahak. You know, be mindful of Allah and Allah will take care of your business for you. Be mindful of Allah, you will find Allah in front of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran shows us that we should be so invested as fathers in our children that when we look at the life of Sayyidina Ibrahim before he was married, so some of our young brothers are like, oh snap, I should have played Angry Birds or something because he's talking about being a father and I'm not a father. But, or FIFA or something. Think about this, that you know when Ibrahim was young, before his marriage, before he has a family, رَبَّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ تُرِّيَاتِ He's always making dua for his children. Before he's married, ahead of the game. The other example of the virtue of having a father in your life and being a father is the example of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam yajidaka yatiman fa'awa. Do we not find you as an orphan? Meaning that to be an orphan, saba. To be an orphan, to not have parents, is difficult. So we understand the opposite would be whoever is not an orphan, then this is a ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's challenged from the beginning, he does not have his parents with him. And that's why he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Adabani Rabbi Fa'ahsana Ta'diba, that Allah was the one who raised me. So what we'll do quickly, maybe 20 minutes or less, is talk about some of the qualities that we should try to acquire um, as fathers, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish, inshaAllah. And the first one is that oftentimes, as fathers, and I speak as a father, we expect to have perfect families. You know, I have a problem with this actually. When you go to Muslim conferences or sometimes you hear Friday sermons and people talk about the ideal Muslim family. And when you listen to these talks, if you are a father, you begin to realize how horrible you are as a father. And that's basically what you walk out with. Because you'll hear these perfect stories like, you know, these people, they prayed, you know, to Hajjid with their children for 45 years and they fasted every day and, you know, they, they saved Quds and they memorized the Quran. And so you hear these stories, many of them are actually fictitious, they're not authentic, which uh, portray, quote unquote, the ideal family. And then you couple that with some of the cultural notions of what family should be like, God forbid your son is, you know, an artist instead of a lawyer or a doctor, right? We know that there's this tremendous pressure or your son becomes a sheikh or an imam. You know, I remember once I was in one community and one young man, he decided to become an imam and his parents said, you'll never get married. You know, you just signed yourself to a life of bachelorhood. And, you know, those things tend to create this hope for like a perfect family. And oftentimes we put so much pressure on our young people that they, they, they pop, they can't handle it. But let's look at the Qur'an and look at families, you know? And what's the first family? Is the first family historically? Adam, is that a normal family? Like a son killed his brother. You know, one of his brothers killed his other brother. Can you imagine if there was a family in a community whose one of the siblings killed another sibling? It would be like an uproar. Right? Like, it would be the talk of the town. Right? So it's not a normal family. This is a prophet. Nabi Adam salam. The next family is who? Sayyidina Nuh. Oh, there is a normal family. Yeah. إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكِ Allah said, this is not your son. He refused to listen to his father and he drowned. The next family, Sayyidina Ibrahim, you know, You know, I saw in my dream that I'm going to slaughter you. This is a normal family. It's not a normal family. After that, Sayyidina Yusuf, okay, normal family. Yeah, right. His brothers threw him in a well and sold him bithaman and baksin for nothing. Right? Out of hasid. That's a normal family. I mean, can you imagine one day if your child came home and you're like, where's, where's Beta? Uh, I don't know. And then you see Beta on eBay. You know, and selling your son on eBay or Craigslist or whatever. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd, be, you'd be angry. You'd be extremely upset. But your, your brother put your other brother on eBay. Right? For a cheap price. Bid. Five minutes left. <laughs> and the next family, and you continue, after Sayyidina Yusuf, is Sayyidina Maryam. She's a single mother. It's not a normal family. And you go all the way up to Sayyidina Rasulullah you find anything but ideal families. In fact, these are the families of prophets who have like problems that you and I can't imagine. Like, I'm not worried about my daughter putting my son on eBay, hopefully. You know, I'm not worried about my son killing his sister. I'm not worried about the type of challenges that they went through. So the point is that 
we are portraying the ideal of a family which is not Quranic. The Quranic portrayal of families, even the families of the prophets, is that they are families that are dealing with very real challenges. And they embrace those challenges. The beauty of Islam is that Islam does not ask us to be perfect, but Islam asks us to be honest and forthright about our vulnerabilities and then address those vulnerabilities with Islam. Our community, we want to ignore our vulnerabilities and ignore our mistakes and never address them. And in the country, I'm from the country in the south, although I live on the east coast, and my mother, who is from the farmlands, she used to say, you know, if you put things under the rug, because when we were little, you know, to clean the house, we always hide things under the rug. Yeah, it's clean, right? And it's like the rug is like this. You know, so why is your bike under the rug? You know, there's a chapati under the rug, man. And she used to say to us, you know, if you, if you keep hiding things under the rug, one day you're going to fall on your face. So the communities, we continue to ignore reality so that we can feel comfortable about ourselves. Oh, we're the greatest ummah, we're the best ummah, nahnu ala khair, alhamdulillah. And then we won't address real serious issues, nor we allow the community to collectively address very serious issues. So the rug is just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. So the first thing is that Islam is a perfect system for imperfect people. That Islam is a perfect faith for people who are not perfect. And that's why the Prophet said, Kullu bani adam khattah. Everybody of you, every one of you will make mistakes. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the first thing as fathers that we really should try to balance is, of course, the aspirations for our children, the children, our hope for our children, but then understanding that they are human beings, they are people, they will make mistakes, they are going to fall, they are going to slip, they are going to, you know, steal something out of the sadaqah box or, you know, wear their shoes in the masjid or, you know, something crazy that kids do because kids are kids. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he understood this. So, for example, the greatest youth in history are Sayyidina Hassan and Hussein. radiallahu anhuma. But can you imagine one day Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's praying in the masjid, he goes into sujood and they jump on his back in sujood. And they begin to like ride him like a horse while he's praying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Sayyid al-Hasan or Sayyidina Hussein. And you know, the Sahaba came a little upset, like, yeah, you know, what's wrong with these kids? And then the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he finished praying, he said, these are the best writers. Ni'mal fadisha. You know, this is the best person to be a knight or the best person to ride an animal, to ride a horse. So you see him, he embraces their humanity. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi And from embracing humanity comes tremendous barakah. Not that we accept haram, it's not what we're saying, but we expect people out of their humanness and the fact that they are not Allah or a prophet to make mistakes, right? To embrace that reality. So the Prophet Sallallahu teaches us that, and there was great barak- barakah that came out of this, you know. Imam as suyuti who's Khatim al Hufat, the last person they say to memorize a million hadith in Egypt. Um, he died in 9-11, Hijriya. Uh, Imam Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, he died in 852, Hijriya. So, almost you know, 50-something years. And Imam al suyuti he used to, as a child, his father died, he was an orphan. And his uncle, who was Turkish and Egyptian, used to take him to Masjid Ibn al-Tadun to pray. And to play, he, Ibn Tulun is massive, much. I mean, this is small compared to Ibn Tulun. Ibn Tulun is like, if you break your wudu, it's like a five-hour walk to make, make wudu. It's like, you, it's huge. Yeah, it's a massive place. And Al-Siyuti, his uncle, used to go there and listen to Ibn Hajar, teach hadith. And this is a little kid, he's running around, you know, and making noise and being a kid. And, you know, people... Some people got upset, some people didn't care, and it happened more than once. And then one day, you know, Imam uh, Ibn Hajar, he looked at this small toddler and he said, uh, I see, you know, a good future in this kid. Like, I see something in this child. So he said, I give him ijazah 
and every asanid I have to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi And Imam, this was Imam Suyuti. So Imam Suyuti used to brag, he used to tell people, I have the asanid of Ibn Hajar, you don't. Because they were like, how did you get these asanid? Because you never met him, you were a child. So this is the reason that he got it. Can you imagine if uh, Ibn Hajar would have thrown him out of the masjid or, you know, what kind of child is this? This is not the ideal child. This is not the ideal Muslim. No, no, he embraces his humanity. Radiallahu anhu. And then he blesses him, alhamdulillah, with asanid, muttasila, ila sayyid al awali wal akhirin. The second thing after that is that we should embrace the idea of trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not as easy as we think it is because oftentimes I, I'm very similar to you, I work hard I save money to put my children in the best institutions, private Muslim schools, you know, to get them into the best colleges, we have everything planned out, but sometimes when we over plan we forget that Allah is Al-Qadir and you know, Al-Muhasibi said, Iyakum wa tadbir. Al-Muhasibi, Abu Harith Al-Muhasibi. Al-Harith Abu Abdullahi Al-Muhasibi. He said, Iyakum wa tadbir. He means, like, don't plan to the point that you try to become the one who makes qada. Like, when it happens, alhamdulillah. Leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said another beautiful, Ari nafsik, min kathrat tadbir. Means, like, give yourself a break from trying to, like, wish that qada was different but embrace what Allah has given you فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فتوكل عَلَى اللَّهِ as Allah says in the Quran so there's a great story that exemplifies this aspiration of all fathers for our children to be successful from one of the great scholars of Egypt he lived some years ago Abdul Wahab al-Sha'rani and there's actually a gate in Al-Qahira called Babu al-Sha'rani named after him and he's buried close to that place and he was a, one of the most erudite scholars of the Shafi'i Madhab in his day. That's why he was called Ra'is al-Shafi'i. He was called the head of the Shafi'i Madhab in his time. He was a great scholar. He wrote Tabaqat al-Shafi'i. He wrote a number of incredible books. And, you know, in his memoirs, he talks about his son. And he laments about how his son is really not inclined to scholarship as his father was. And he mentions, you know, I wish that my son would have followed in my path and I wish my son would be like I am because I am, you know, I am Sheikh al-Islam, I am this mufti, I am this great scholar, I am this, I am that, I am this, I am that. And then he finally in his memoirs he writes later on, you know, that was the problem, the problem was I. You know, in World War I there was an essay contest, um, who can successfully propose a way to solve the world's problems in an essay, you know, in like 400 war essay. So this man, I believe he was from Scandinavia, he won it, and his answer was, I am. That was the answer, I am. Like, I am the solution. There's no need for anything else, it's just I am, I am responsible, that won the essay contest. But Muslims were a little different, like, I am bi you know, and Sha'rani, he said, I realized that the problem was me. He said, you know, I, I was relying on myself, like I'm a sheikh, I'm a scholar, I'm this, you know, so my son should be like this. So he said, I remember the, the, the statement of Allah, you know, I surrender my affairs to Allah. So I left everything to Allah. And then, after some time, his son, he became a great scholar. One of the narrations said he came home, maybe this is a little bit of embellishment, a fictitious embellishment to make the story sound good, but you find it in some of the texts that you know he came home and he found his son studying. And from that point onwards, his son became you know, a great scholar himself. So not to trust in our family, oh, we're from Muslim countries, we have Muslim families, your father, your grandfather was a bazook sahib, you know, your great-great-grandfather was a maulana, this doesn't mean anything. فَلَمْ يُغْنِي عَنْكُمَا مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا Allah said about the wives of Prophet Nuh and Prophet Lut, it didn't help them, right? النَّسَبْ وَالْقَرَابَةِ لَا يُغْنِي شَخْصًا doesn't help anybody, but what helps us is 
to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Sahaba asked the Prophet وسلم, after he said, لا يدخل أحد الجنة none of you will enter Jannah بعملي أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم no one will enter Jannah based on their deeds even you, O Messenger of Allah so we see the Prophet's response even me unless Allah has rahmah to me so his trust is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala although he has this professional success the next is that we should spend time with our children you know studies show that uh, children do better in school they do better in life when fathers are active participants in their lives what I mean by spending time is not like I'm at home watching PTV and my kids are playing around I'm spending time with my kids watching the news or I take them to the park and I'm busy you know with my phone and my kids are playing Baba Baba just one minute just gonna check the cricket scores real quick right that's not spending time with my children that is being around but presence is very different and the best example I can give you is khushu' you know someone can pray someone can stand and pray but they're not in prayer you know someone can stand and pray and think about stocks think about retirement you know think about the car getting fixed where am I getting my edge up done um, the new Samsung phone you name it Right? So they're in salah, la kin bila khushu, without concentration. So the same, same way, I can be with my kids, but there's no khushu. Some people told me this is impossible, especially us as men. You know men how we are, right? So I said to them, no, every day actually we have khushu, we just don't realize it. So brothers asked me how. I said, have you ever been in a situation where your wife is yelling at you and you heard nothing? That's why all of you are laughing because you know it's true, right? Your wife could be like right here, just barking things at you, right? Telling you to do things, and you're just like. And then she'll say to you, Did you hear a word I said? Were you talking? That's for sure. So when you read like stories of Tabi'een, they were praying and like walls would fall and they didn't notice, it happened because we do it all the time, every day. Same thing with our kids. Our kids could have told us like a hundred things and we didn't hear anything. And they're right there in front of us because we have khushu and something else. Right? And, and you know what we say? You have khushu and what you love and what you value. So it's about presence. So if we look at the Quran, we look at with qal luqmanu li banihi wa huwa ya'idhuhu ya bunayya la tushrik billah. We see Sayyidina al-Luqman ya'idhu. He's invested in his son. Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik used to say, Rasulullah never spoke to us except he looked at us straight in our face. And we never spoke to him except he paid attention to us. You felt, Sayyidina Ali said, you felt that you were the most beloved person to him, whoever you were. And that's why Amr ibn As, he got confused in Sahih Muslim. And he comes to the Prophet because he actually thinks like the Prophet loves him the most. Because how the Prophet invests in people when they're with him. Sayyidina Amr ibn As, he said, you know, I went to him and I said, Ayyu nas ahabbu ilayk, who do you love the most? Because he thought it was him. And he said, Aisha. So then Amr ibn As, he was upset, like, he said, why? So then he said to him, women are rijal. But what about the men? Like, hey, let's still know what about the men. Rasulullah was like, Abuha, her dad. But the point is he thought because of how the Prophet would invest himself with everyone who spoke to him, everyone who engaged him, that he was the most beloved of, to the Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet Wasallam is present in relationships, completely present, not just physically present. Once we were in Egypt in Al-Azhar, uh, in our class in Usul of Fiqh, we had this professor, he's really funny, he's like, he could be a comedian. Uh, his name was Sa'd, jo, uh, Sa'd uh, Jewish and um, Sa'ad Zaydan and uh, it was a massive class of people man like 500 people in the classroom and uh, he was explaining this thing in Usul of Fiqh it's really difficult to understand and he said hey 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 there's this kid in the front from Indonesia he said Antamin Fin in Egyptian 
He's like, where are you from? He said, I'm from Indonesia. He said, really? Let me ask you a question. See, yeah, he said, your body is where? He said, Qahira. In Cairo. He said, Wa'akluk fein. But your mind is where? He said, Jakarta. My mind is in Jakarta. So the Sheikh, he said, in Usul, wal jam'u wajibun ma amkana. You know, in Usul, you have to make two things work together. So please, bring your mind and your body here. Same thing as fathers. When we're with our boys, with our daughters, we should ask ourselves, my, my body is here, but where is my heart? Where is my mind? Where is my soul? They'll feel it. Wallahi, they will feel it if we're not present. The last two things, and we'll stop inshallah with ta'ala, is that we, as, <coughs> as fathers, we have to make sure that we live an example of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islamic schools are salt on the food. Right? Madrasas, Maulana Sahib, Yasabna Quran, Abu Huraira teaching my kid, Abba teaching my kid. That's not, that's not the, um, how should I say it? You know, that's not, that's the chutney. That's not the biryani. That's chutney. You don't, you don't put chutney all over your food. Right? You just don't dump chutney all over the food. But you put it sparingly. So the teachers, the Islamic educators, all of these programs, weekend courses, هذا ملح هذا طعام. It's salt on the food. But the crux of the matter is you and your family and how you live your life. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourself and your family from the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya ayyuha al-nabiyu qul li azwajika wa banatika. O Prophet, say to your wives and your daughters and then to the rest of the believers. So Shaykh al-Sabuni said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began with the Prophet's family and his responsibility to be an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقَ نَحْنُ نَزُّقَكُمْ Allah said in Surah Al-Isra, you know, order your families to pray. Meaning, be an example of the person who, who prays and who lives a righteous life. Once I was in a city and this girl, she's in America, this girl, she raised her hand. She said, is it halal to backbite? I said, La hawla, what, I, what, like, what kind of question is it halal to backbite, Yani? Like, I've never heard this question before. It's like, is it halal to make suit? You know, like you, you don't hear this kind of question. You know, is it halal to hit people? So I said to her, um, I need to talk to you after the mahabra. So after the lecture, she came up to me and I said, you know, why would you ask me if it's halal to backbite? She said, well, my, I see my father all the time talking about people. And my mom, every time she's on the phone, if she's not watching one of those 18 hour long movies, she's talking about somebody on the phone to her friends. So I thought it's halal because my parents do it. Because you are, whether you know it or not, and I am, whether we know it or not, we are mufassir kitabi lah li awladi. We are the tafsir of Quran and Sunnah to our kids. I don't care if you tell, I'm not an Imam, I'm not a Maulana, not, it doesn't matter. It, to your children and to my children, we are Mufassirs. We are Mufassir al Deen, Mufassir al Dunya, Mufassir al Akhirah. We are those who explain everything they see through a model. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, he if you divide his sunnah, you see that the most in number is amari. It's not qawli, are his actions. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And that's why honesty and being forthright with our children has barakah. Imam al-Dhahabi is one of the great scholars of hadith. Imam al-Dhahabi, his, son, his, na- his son's name was Abu Hurairah. You know, he named his son Abu Huraira. And in Lisan al-Mizan, his book of Rijal, he, he comes to his son, 
Abu Huraira ibn al Zahabi. And you know, he has to say, is he authentic? Is he weak? Is he this? Is he this? So he says, my son is da'if because he forgets a lot. Like he's honest. He said, he's lazy and he forgets a lot. Like there's honesty there. There's not like, so he lives an example for his son to follow. It's harsh. Sometimes the truth is bitter. Sometimes the truth, the truth doesn't taste great. It's not like Kashmiri tea. Sometimes it's like Egyptian tea, right? It just doesn't go as sweet as you would like it. The last point is that we should engage our, our children. Oftentimes as parents, we think we are supervisors, where we should be advisors. There's a difference between a supervisor, musaytir, and advisor, nasi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet, lasta alayhim bi musaytir. You're not a supervisor. But then, inna lakum la nasihun ameen. Nasih. I'm a sincere advisor. Ad-deenu nasiha. Prophet said that religion is advice. So that means that we should also be good listeners, you know. We shouldn't just be barking orders at our kids, but we should actually cause them to think and explore and engage. Allah said to the Prophet, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Take shura with them, even though the Prophet is ma'asum. وَاللَّهُ يَعْصِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the example of Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wassalam, who sees in his dream that he's going to slaughter his son. فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى And he asked him in Surah Al-Safat, what, what are your thoughts about this? You know, he didn't come home and say, Khalas, meet me out back, sharpen the knives, it's time to go. لا فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى Because this wasn't wahi, because he saw this dream in his sleep, and we believe that the dreams the prophets see in their sleeps is not wahi, only the visions they see while they're awake. So he goes to his son, فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى قَالَ يَا أَبَا تِفْحَرْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ Right? He engages his son. What do you think about it? What are your thoughts on it? Sometimes culturally, it's considered disrespectful or a shame for our children to talk with us or to share with us or to correct us even. But this is not the case in Islam. Because every heart speaks by the inspiration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every word, every moment, perhaps is ayah min ayatillah that we can benefit naqtabis minha. We can take the good from. So we find that you know, Sayyidina Umar, he used to ask his sons their opinions. Sayyidina Uthman used to ask his children their opinions on things. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to talk to the children sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and encourage them. Imam al-Zuhri radiallahu anhu, the great scholar of hadith and the mufti, and the sheikh of Imam Malik used to come to Medina and he would ask young people, what do you think about these things? What are your thoughts on these things? He would engage them. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yuthabitna wa antum ala haqq insha'Allah. وإياكم على الحق كما نسأله سبحانه وتعالى يحفظ أولادنا وينور قلوبنا جزاكم الله خيرا أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله ولكم فاستغفروا Finally we say you know that we have human appeal uh, and, and another job of uh, parents is to help parents who are struggling with their parenthood and the Prophet said المسلم للمسلم كالبنيان يشد بعضنا بعضا we are like a building that helps each other so now in Syria you know, we're talking about, imagine the horror of a parent just knowing that your children don't have food or clothing, that you don't know where they're going to live or sleep the next night. So, I would like to encourage you to help Human Appeal as much as you can. Thank you for your uh, wonderful invitation to your community. We look forward to visiting you again, inshallah, in the future. Jazakumallah khairan. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum.